Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial on Trespass to Land. Trespass to Land occurs where a person directly enters upon another person's land without permission or they start on the land with permission and then remain on it and refuse to leave or they place or project any object upon the land and this tort is actionable per se without the need to prove damage. First thing to note is that trespass to land doesn't just cover walking onto somebody's land. There are actually three ways that you can commit trespass to land. So you can see on this slide that the first way that you can commit trespass to land is by entering upon the land. And this means that the person has walked onto the land without permission, or they've refused to leave when permission has been withdrawn, or they've thrown objects onto the land. The second way that we can commit trespass to land is through trespass to the airspace. So trespass to airspace above the land can be committed. So for example, if a person's got an advertising board projecting over into the claimant's property, that can be trespass to airspace. But just please note here that the Civil Aviation Act from 1982 means that you can't take action in nuisance or trespass if an aircraft flies over your property at a reasonable height. So you're not going to be able to sue if you've got aeroplanes, easy jet planes flying over your house, I'm afraid. And the third way that you can commit trespass to land is actually trespass beneath the surface. So it might be that the defendants are mining from their land under the claimant's land and you can have trespass to the subsoil. So to sue in trespass, um, the claimant must have possession of the land um, and they must have exclusive possession of the land in order to sue. So we'll have a look at what the requirements are to sue in this tort and I've got these listed on this slide for you. So as I've just said, trespass to land involves the unjustifiable interference with land which is in the immediate and the exclusive possession of another. It's actionable per se, so you don't have to prove any damage. Um, when we study nuisance, which is similar in some respects, you have to prove that there was harm. But trespass to land, you don't have to prove there was any harm whatsoever. The mere fact that somebody or something has entered onto your land is enough. But you can see on this slide there are four essential elements. Firstly, there has to be a direct interference with the land. Secondly, the interference must be voluntary. Thirdly, there is no need for the defendant to be aware that he's trespassing. And fourthly, there's no need for the claimant to experience any harm or loss. So we'll have a closer look at each of these elements now. Element one is that there has to be direct interference with the land. And this is illustrated in the case of Southport Corporation and ESSO. And in this case, we had an oil tanker that had ran aground um, and oil was deliberately discharged in order to free the tanker so it could be moved. And the oil drifted onto the claimant's land and into a marine lake. And the claimant was bringing an action for nuisance, negligence and trespass. But we're only interested in the trespass element here. Now, this case went to the Court of Appeal and you can see that the court said that the defendants were liable for negligence, but not trespass. Because what they said here was that the oil was not directly on the foreshore, but in the estuary. So for there to be a trespass, it has to be directly discharged onto the claimant's land. In this particular case, it sort of drifted and eventually ended up on the land. That's not the direct interference that we need. So if Esso had come along and dumped the oil onto the claimant's land, there would have been a trespass. But this drifting was not enough. Requirement two is that the interference with the land has to be voluntary on the part of the defendant. So in Stone and Smith, and you can see this is an ancient case here from 1647, um, it was said that a person who is forcibly carried or thrown onto the land is not trespassing. So it can only be a trespass if the person has voluntarily entered the land. And I think that's fair enough. 
Um, and you sometimes see it, I certainly see it, little kids leaving school and they'll be playing with their friends and one friend will push another friend into a front gate, push them into someone's front yard. It'd be very unfair if we found that kid that had got pushed into the yard as being guilty of a trespass because they haven't entered onto the land voluntarily. They were pushed. So the interference with the land must be voluntary. Our third rule is that awareness of trespassing is not needed. So our defendant doesn't need to know that they're trespassing in order to be guilty. So we've got a case, Conway and George Wimpy here. The Court of Appeal said that a person can be liable for trespass even if he mistakenly thought he owned the land or wrongly believed that they had permission to enter the land. So they're guilty just from deliberately entering onto the land, even if they think they've got a right to be there, that can still be a trespass. Um, and that's a very useful rule practically, because if you had to prove that someone was intending to trespass, that would be incredibly difficult because people would always just say, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I thought I had a right to be here. I thought they wouldn't mind. So no awareness um, is needed for this tort. We've already mentioned the fourth rule here, that there's no need for the claimant to experience harm or loss. We've got a little bit of Latin. Trespass to land is actionable per se. That means in itself. So even if there's no harm whatsoever, and a lot of the case there won't be with a trespass, if I just step onto someone's land and step off, obviously there's no harm there. But you can still be liable in trespass. There is no need for the defendant um, to have caused the claimant any damage or any loss. The bit that we need to consider a little bit further though is how you commit a trespass above the land, i.e. trespass to airspace, and how you commit a trespass below the land um, or trespass beneath the earth. So if I just remind you, um, if I scroll back to this first slide, that trespass can occur in these three situations, entering on the land into airspace beneath the surface. What we need to look at is what's going to count as airspace and what's going to count as beneath the surface. How low and how high does the claimant own? So that's what we're going to consider now. And we have a very ancient, um, <coughs> excuse me, Latin saying here. I'm not even going to attempt to say it out loud on video because I'll just be mocked forever, I'm sure. Um, so this is the Latin phrase that you can have a go pronouncing yourself. And it's an ancient phrase, which means he who owns the land owns to the heavens and down to hell. So years and years ago, we had the belief that when you owned the land, um, you owned a house, you owned everything above it and everything below it. Practically, nowadays, that cannot stand. There has to be a limit to how much airspace and subsoil you actually own. So in recent cases, um, we've had to consider how much the claimant um, owns and can therefore claim a trespass on. So we're going to start with Star Energy. And in Star Energy, Lord Hope said that the phrase, this Latin phrase here, still has value in English law as encapsulating in simple language a proposition of law which is commanded general acceptance. So what he was saying is there is still some merit in this, but there has to be limits. And in this Star Energy case, it was actually a Supreme Court decision, hence the SC here. Um, the Supreme Court said that the defendants had trespassed when they drilled oil wells that were 244 metres to 853 metres below the surface of the claimant's land. So that's pretty deep. Um, and Lord Hope again here is trying to explain or define how much subsoil or beneath the surface the claimant owns. So I've got quite a long quote from him here and I've included it because I think it's quite interesting. Um, so he's talking about how much the owner of the house owns beneath the surface. And he's saying there must obviously be some stopping point. 
Um, I'm going to highlight this here. So there must obviously be some stopping point as one reaches the point at which physical features such as pressure and temperature render the concept of the strata belonging to anybody so absurd as to not worth arguing about. Oops. So I quite like this quote from him. So he's trying to define for us um, at what point you, you don't own beneath the surface of your house. And he's saying there's some stopping point, but it's going to be probably where pressure and temperature of the centre of the earth, presumably, render the concept um, of anyone owning it so absurd. So basically, you own beneath your property right down um, at least 853 metres, probably further till it's too hot to bother about. So that's a fairly clear answer on how much beneath the surface um, that the claimant owns. Let's have a look then at um, trespass in airspace. So the case on trespass in airspace is Bernstein and Sky Views. And what happened here was the defendants had flown over the claimant's land, took an aerial photo of the land and then tried to sell it to him. And he was most irritated by this. Um, and he was suing them for trespass, for flying over his land. And what the court said here was that the claimant only has the right to airspace, which is necessary for the ordinary use and enjoyment of his land and buildings. So. I highlight that bit as well. So there's your keywords here. So you own above it ordinary use and enjoyment. So in other words, for something to be trespassing into your airspace, I suppose it'd be like a sign coming over your garden fence, but it's at a height where you might potentially hit your head. Um, or, you know, it's interfering with the enjoyment of your garden. If it is way above your house, that's not going to be enough. And remember I said at the beginning that the Civil Aviation Act also means that you're not going to be able to have a claim against, you know, an easy jet aeroplane. They are entitled to fly above houses, obviously. Let's pass ab initio. This is a little bit of Latin for you. Ab initio is Latin for from the beginning. So this is quite interesting. Um, it's a bit outdated now. We don't tend to use it anymore. Um, Previously, it was used um, mostly with police cases. So if um, a person enters a land with authority, like the police, but then they go beyond their power and abuse that authority, we say that they have actually um, cancelled out their own permission to be there retrospectively, and they're deemed to have been a trespass from the moment they walked through the door, i.e. trespass ab initio. There are some defences that can be claimed by the defendant, legal authority or justification by law, licence and also necessity. Legal authority as a defence is quite limited. Um, to be honest, if it comes up for you guys in a scenario, it'll probably be the police. So the police obviously have rights to enter premises, to make arrests and to carry out their work. And they have legal authority to do that under PACE 1984, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. So they are justified sometimes in committing a trespass. Another defence is licence. And a licence just means permission to enter the land. And it can be express, implied or contractual. So in the case of Wood, a man was ejected from a horse race course, even though he had a ticket, and it was held that his contractual licence, i.e. his ticket to be there, could be revoked at any time, making him a trespasser. So that illustrates that when you buy a ticket to go to the cinema or something, you have a contractual licence to be there, so it's not a trespass, but it can be revoked. Necessity, fairly limited defence. Private necessity might be that you need to commit uh, what would otherwise be a trespass to protect your own property against the threat of harm or a public necessity to protect the wider public. So I might have to trespass into a neighbour's garden if there was a wheelie bin on fire or something like that. Remedies there will end on this slide. Damages and injunctions, 
orders for possession and abatement where um, property has to be returned.